Well, thank you very much, um, Arka, for, for joining us. Um, uh, I, uh, Ar I, Arka is an associate professor in um, ECE and physics at UW and um, is going to tell us about uh, challenges and opportunities for optical neural network. So are you able to share? Yes, great. All right, okay. I can get started. Um, so yeah, I think, um, uh, should I get started, Kit, or? Yeah. Please. Uh, what about the recording? It seems to be on. It does. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So yeah, I think um, I'm going to tell you some, some of the work that we're doing on optical neural network. And my background is more on the optic side. And we are interested in figuring out that can we use optics to accelerate uh, neural networks or machine learning hardware in general. And uh, Shichie mentioned that there is a lot of interest from your center. So I wanted to tell you what is the going on at least in my lab and probably give you a broad overview of what is going on in this field. And uh, most of the work you can find from my website. And if you have further questions to kind of explore some opportunity, you can send me an email or Chichi can uh, make us connected. Uh, just very briefly, uh, my team and different funding sources who support uh, these works. And uh, of course, like there's a lot of federal funding, but some of the work that we do, we have a interest in making things um, in, in maybe autonomous systems. That's why there's also a lot of interest from the industry side as well. Okay, so let's start with the kind of broad uh, idea that why photonics for computing? And this is not a new idea. People have thought about photonics for computing many, many times. And there are largely three reasons why you want to do it. One is the light provides an enormous bandwidth. So you, for optical communication, you can get very large bandwidth either to the light optical fiber itself or using wavelength division multiplexing. And all of you know that this is how like our internet works. And this is a reality right now. People are actually, of course, op fiber communication used with light, people are bringing into data centers. There's a recent work from um, Google on creating TPU with the light. So this is a reality that already happens. It's happening in the industrial scale. Now, in my opinion, that's not optics for computing. It's optics for communication, which helps with computing. Okay. That's what is the second point also, that these are kind of almost lossless communications, right? So both bandwidth and loss communication, these are not really part of the computing, but really for the computing, what happens that light does not interact with other light. So there is an inherent parallelism offered by light. What I mean by that, if you take two point source, and you shine light, they will cross each other. They don't do anything. Like for the, you're gonna have two wires. So in general, if you want to have a many, 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 many wires, um, light can give you a very high advantage. For example, in free space, you can put a lens, a, a display, and the camera, you get a 10 to the power 12 uh, channels. Doing that with, with, with electronics will be very difficult. In fact, when I was in Intel, uh, I worked in Intel for a year, someone told me, the back in the days, in 1960s and 70s, when people really started thinking about optics for this kind of free space computing, not neural network, it's mostly this Fourier optics for vector matrix multiplication, even though there are some, at the time, still some idea on the neural network. Um, why people like thought that optics would be good and electronics won't be is no one believed that it is possible to make zillions of wire on chip. And if you read this book, uh, the, the chip, chip, chip war, uh, that's this book like that to talk about chips. They talk about this interconnects a lot. In fact, Intel's really the, I think their secret sauce is making these um, wires, not making the silicon, making the dope. That's only one, one layer. And then you have all those wires that, that goes in. Okay, but that's what the light is good for, okay? But of course, there are some challenges. And I said, like the optical computing failed. This is um, not a known, unknown thing. People have looked into back in 1980s, 1990s. There are a lot of interest, a lot of money flowed in, a lot of company, a lot of research, and nothing went anywhere. And the reason the optical computing failed, if you go back and start thinking about it, there are two reasons, in my opinion, or two class of reasons. One, one is intrinsic reasons that intrinsic to the optics. And what are those? The optics are large. And if you just mis misalign them, they don't really work. Right? So that's like, this is a picture of my optics table that my group members put together. You can see like, it's, it's a fairly finicky process. Anything goes out, your optical system goes, um, goes out of the um, alignment. It doesn't really work. Uh, lack of nonlinearity. 
So I mentioned the light not interact with each other, which is good sometimes, but it's also bad. Like you need nonlinear activation to do something that's computing wise, and that doesn't really work in uh, with, with light. You, you light don't interact with each other easily. And then the lack of tunable material. Um, so how do you change the optics? That's also very hard. And um, this is a picture of an SLM. If you look into current SLM, your space bandwidth product is just on the order of like maybe 10 to the power nine, which is not that much, that how much data you can handle at the same time. So these are the three reasons I think that light has some inherent problem, but there are some extrinsic reasons. One is back in the days in 1980s, people did not think neural network works. Uh, I was talking to um, um, Professor David Brady. He is um, from University of Arizona. He was, he did a lot of work at the, at the time in the 1980s with Professor Dimitri Saltis. And he was saying that people were kind of at the same saying, oh, this optical neural network is, uh, is a BS square because it's not just BS because we don't know how the neural network works and then we don't know whether the optics work or not. Now, by now we kind of know the neural network kind of works. So I think still the jury is out on that. People kind of say like, hundreds hey, works, something doesn't work. But I think this community, we believe that the neural network works for many applications. At least we can say that. And there is a clear need to accelerate the neural network. And that is due to the second extrinsic reasons that back in the days, electronic computers and software were not that well developed. They, there was a meteoric rise of those. They started outperforming optics by many, many orders of magnitude. And optics did not really have an idea that how, that how can we uh, catch up to that. So I'm going to tell you that at this point, I say like this one is somewhat um, alleviated. We understand neural network works and the electronic computers and software as we have read in many, many papers, including the chat GPT when people start thinking about that this is actually a climate a challenge, like amount of power you need. But long story short, that the electronic computer and software do not scale with the power and latency as much as we would like it to. And I think that some of the things that you guys are doing in the software, uh, is in, in the center, is really geared towards that, that there is a really a challenge that's coming from electronic systems and software. And it may be a good idea to kind of think about can optics solve those things. The extrinsic reasons are somewhat ele elevated, for intrinsic reasons, like there are a few things that make, make it a very good time for optics to come back. One is that we call nanophotonics and meta optics. That's really what I work on. That's my, my, my kind of, uh, my, my group's main expert is that we can make these optical systems on chip. So like electronic integrated circuits, we can make photonic integrated circuits. We can make, uh, so this is actually, uh, uh, this whole thickness is less than like one, uh, less than 10 micron and we can fit 10 resonators here. You can't even see it. We can probe each resonators using uh, gratings. So essentially there's a significant amount of integration that we can do on chip. Um, we design those, we fabricate those. Then we can also make meta optics. So this all dotted lines, this is, an, this is a classic objective, but this all the dotted lines that you are seeing, the dots, those are one lens, each of them. And we can make them by nano patterning uh, the substrate. So that is one of the things. The second thing is there are a lot of new material system that can help us with tuning. Uh, there's a quantum confined structure, people are looking into atomic, atomically thin materials, phase change materials. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about those things at the end of the, maybe some of the future work. And then there's also like materials for nonlinear optics. So as such, I think there is some progress in optics over the last 20 years on making things small, making things more tunable, making things more nonlinear, and the lack of extrinsic reasons give us a good way to kind of maybe start thinking about is optics our solution for the scaling, okay? So what are the things optics can do? So as I mentioned, optics is interconnect for high performance computing. That's a reality. And many of this advancement that I've talked about, like making optics smaller, new material, this really came from this optical interconnect. Um, Intel has a big program and we work with Intel very closely on the silicon photonics. Um, this is reality, this already is happening. We are not going to talk about it that much. Now there is one idea is called, can we do digital logic with optics? And I think by now almost everyone agrees in the community that's really not where optics shines because electronics is so much better to do the digital logic with that, okay? Analog computing, um, all optical. So in this case, the idea is that we are doing everything analog and 
to get some of the nonlinearity in light, we go back to electronics, but not explicitly. So we use some sort of optoelectronic feedback to do this nonlinearity. Because at the end of the day, light cannot interact with light. There is always a material systems that's needed that we know from like very fundamental physics. But can we use the material to engineer some interaction between light, but without explicitly going from light to an electronic signal? And then there's a hybrid electrophotonics computing where idea is that we do some part in light, we convert it back to electronics, they do something in electronics, convert it back to light. And we recently showed in a work that these kind of approaches are also not very efficient, especially the signal transduction between optics to electronics and electronics to optics add up a significant latency and significant power. Okay, so it's to my, in my opinion, at least this is also a no-go. So these two are no-go. And the third one, which I think is probably the most interesting application wise, is this computational imaging and computer vision with nanophotonics. So computational imaging and computer vision are really kind of a growing field. Uh, just, just to give an idea for the computer vision field, um, back in like 2005 or 2006 in Stanford computer vision class, they have like enrollment of 10 and that now they have an enrollment of more than like 300. It's so much so that they are going into a MOOC. Um, and the computer vision is everywhere. Like if you think about like your phone has cameras and all those things, and they also have some challenges, like for example, autonomous car, um, how do you kind of do those things very quickly process? So can we use optics? Can you use innovation in optics to do this? So I am going to, um, sorry, mm, okay, so yeah, I'm going to really talk about my group's effort in these two aspects, when analog computing and computer vision and computer shell imaging with nanophotonics, and it will be a fairly, I will say, physics talk. It's not a machine learning talk. I'm not a machine learning engineer. I'm telling you what is possible with the optics, and if you think, and I, I'll, I'll point out at some point of time, okay, what is we where we think that some of the machine learning problems that we are looking for. Because at the end of the day, I do not believe that optics is going to replace all the hardware. There might be some very, very niche specific applications where you need to do some of the linear operations very quickly and optics is one way to do that. And that, that's somewhat worse I'm going to show you. But what are those applications I'm very interested in knowing? And that's why Shichi mentioned, okay, why don't we give a talk and kind of maybe brainstorm to figure out where we can go with this. Okay, so I'm going to tell you two, two different aspects I mentioned. So first, I'm going to talk about that, how can we make an integrated photonics for vector matrix multiplication and nonlinear activation? So the integrated photonics, everything is on chip. And very specifically, we have looked into a single element, like single product that can do vector matrix multiplication. And we have made a lot of progress with this new material called phase change material that can give you essentially zero uh, power um, when, like, when you are not like changing that particular element. And then we'll talk about more on this meta optic side in the free space, what kind of information processing we can do. Okay. Let's start with that. Uh, so this is, um, if you look into a neural network, and that's how I kind of look into it, that um, it's a, you have a vector, you need a ma matrix, you multiply with this matrix, so any convolutional layer, fully connected layer, all of them can be mapped to a matrix, and then you have a nonlinear unit. And this vector matrix multiplication is very power hungry for electronic system. And there are a lot of people who are working on the in-memory computing, and that's something that we are also interested. And we can do that with optics. So this is a paper which arguably kind of restarted this whole field of optical interconnect, came out of MIT. And they said that, hey, if we have an array of interferometer, we can actually do this vector matrix multiplication. And this is not a new idea. Actually, this idea was proposed by um, uh, Zeilinger, like even though he got a Nobel Prize for um, quantum optics, but he had a paper long time back in PRL where he showed that any unitary matrix um, or yeah, any unitary matrix I think can be broken down into like this kind of uh, three different matrices and then you can implement with this uh, beam splitter. So any unitary matrix can be implemented with the beam splitter and all of these are beam splitters. So by using many of these beam splitter, you can make it. And that's what they showed. This is a fairly small demonstration. They essentially did a four by four matrix multiplication. 
It's a volatile uh, using a thermal control of the MZI. But it, they, they mentioned, and it's known by now, um, that this thermal control are very power hungry and they are limit scalability for multiple reasons. One is the way this kind of things work is essentially what you're doing, you're, you're putting an electrical signal. The electrical signal changes the optics. That's where the reconfigurability come, comes in. Um, and uh, you, you change the weight, you change the weight. Uh, so to do that, you need to have a very large change and to get a very large change for a small Delta M, um, you need a very large scale of the device, large length of the device. The other thing that's problematic is if you have two devices and you're heating up one, the other one is also going to heat up. So this thermal crosstalk is really going to kill you. So in and one centimeter by one centimeter device, you can probably put maybe like 100 or 200 MZI that essentially boils down to you can do a five by five, maximum eight by eight matrix multiplication. So this really not scalable. So how can you scale it? So we believe that some of this new material that uh, really coming up, it's not new in the electronics per se, but elect, elect, in optics are fairly new. This non-volatile phase change material, specifically GST, can be used for in-memory computing. So these materials you grow by sputtering, uh, you grow in the amorphous state, and if you uniformly heat it above the glass transition temperature for a long time, it go to crystalline state. And the other side, if you actually or a very high power pulse, you melt the material and rapidly quench it, it goes back to the amorphous state. And in this two state, you actually have a very large change in the index. And uh, this is probably one of the largest change in index you can get from any known material in the whole world. So that gives you a very large delta in that essentially means you can make a device, make a switch, or let's say a programmable unit, or if you can really think about a neural network term, that, that that device that multiplies X with W, okay? Like the input with the one of the element with the uh, with the matrix, you can make it very, very small, okay? Now, there are some problems and my group is really working on trying to solve this problem really in the device level, because in one way, this is important to kind of recognize that uh, scalability could be a fundamental problem, may not be a fundamental problem. It depends on what technology you are using. Uh, so, for example, I my half of my group also work on quantum computing or more like quantum optics. I'll say scalability is very important because the device itself are not scalable. Here, if you use silicon photonics, that people have shown it scalable. People have actually this material, the, this GST, in their foundry. They can put it there. So, if you use commercial foundry, you can really scale it up. So, you really want to improve a single device level and see what can we do with that. Okay. So we started this work almost like five years back and we put this material on silicon and we showed that, okay, there is a, a tunability and we, I'm not going to go about these numbers that much, but these numbers are fairly small compared to thermal, like several orders of magnitude small. Um, and uh, we, we, we demonstrated that, uh, so we demonstrated that we can tune a resonant device. And that resonant device tuning is important because this is how you multiply X with W because when you are, uh, changing the resonance frequency, your light transmission changes. So by you can think about that the light transmission, output light transmission is input times the transfer function of your cavity. So you have some input and by changing the transfer function, you can change the weight. So that's kind of the basic fundamental idea. But the whole thing is that you can do all those things very parallelly with the waveguides and then um, all of them are going to be done with a low power. So what you can get a very large vector matrix multiplication done with a very, very small amount of time. Okay, that, that, that's a basic basic premise. And I, I'll tell you what are the limitations of this, 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 this approaches, but in general, that's, that's the basic idea that we're looking into. But you need a broadband switch. The, how do you make a broadband switch out of it or broadband programmable unit? Because um, you, you want like, you don't want a very strong dependence on the laser wavelength because otherwise you have to stabilize all the resonators. So anyone who has done this before will say like, oh, we, we just use a Mark Zender interferometer and you get a broadband switch. It turns out that doesn't really quite work. The reason is this material turns out to be very lossy in one of the state. So when you change the phase of phase transition, you got the phase transition, you get a delta N, but it also comes with a very large change in K. And when you have a very large change in K, what it means that in one arm, your light gets significantly attenuated compared to the other, so you cannot have good interference. So we came up with this idea of three waveguides. There's a little bit more details I'm going to kind of just talk about like very briefly for this audience. 
But the whole idea is that we can engineer our switch to have a middle waveguide so that in the amorphous state of the GST, light goes from the first waveguide to the second waveguide. In amorphous state, the material is actually less lossy, so overall loss is much lower. In the crystalline GST, where the material actually gets lossy, we, we, we play with this interference condition so the light directly goes through. And what it really gives us that very small insertion loss. So ultimately at the end of the day for integrated photonic kind of switches, we need very small insertion loss because the total power depends on the light power and electrical power. So if I fabricated this device, we showed that it works. This, everything is done in the clean room. These are done on silicon photonics. We then put the GST, so they're all CMOS compatible for fabrication. Um, and we had less than one dB insertion loss, but can you do electrical control? Because that's what we need for vector matrix multiplication. So again, I think some people just joined in that wanted to make sure that we are all on the same page. The idea is we have an input here by changing this in the bar or cross board, we can get a multiplication of the input times some of the weight that we are going to implement here. So to do that, we came up with this idea of creating a silicon heater. So we use a heater, but this heater is slightly different because we heat up the PCM and the PCM undergo a phase transition. So there's a threshold of temperature that you need to reach to cause that phase transition. So you can have two devices very close to each other. We can, if we just he, he, he change the temperature for this one above the threshold, the second one will not reach the threshold. So we essentially effectively have zero thermal crosstalk and we can program this whole device. Now, one thing I probably forgot to mention, these are non-volatile transitions. So once you change it, it, you don't have to apply any signal. And this is actually an extremely powerful ability, which often people who are not really looked into CMOS from like the day of like NMOS or PMOS don't recognize. So if you go back and take an electrical engineering class on CMOS, NMOS, and PMOS, the biggest problem of NMOS and PMOS is in one state, in zero state or one state, it is completely off. The other state, there is a path from VDD to the bias to the ground, okay? That essentially means there is a static energy lost. So switching time, you always lose energy, no problem. But when you are not switching between the zero and one, when this level is steady, 50% uh, of the time you are losing energy. And this made a very big difference. I mean, it's like, if you look back like the history of that, when they came up with CMOS, where they were stacked in MOS with PMOS, this device is off all the time, except when you are switching energy. So that gives you a significant power uh, benefit, which we can get for the first time using this kind of phase change material um, in optics. I mean, people have looked into this kind of many other logic probably can do electronic, but in optics, it was not really possible. Okay, so we can, we demonstrate it can be broadband operation. It can be like many large number of cycles, which we am kind of not going to discuss too much extent, but overall we, we believe that we now have a solution for a programmable unit that can really give you this vector matrix multiplication for a broadband signal for many times. The 5,000 is not good enough, but that's something that we are working to improve uh, with very low optical loss, okay? Uh, can we improve the energy efficiencies further? So this goes a little bit more physics and maybe not necessarily it's prime time for actual technology development, but if you use a graphene heater, um, you can actuate that phase transition in a much, much lower power. And that's something we have demonstrated. Again, broadband operation, large switching, and we show that, okay, that the, the energy density can be orders of magnitude small using this graphene-based heater. Uh, so overall, like I say, like a bit, the energy has to be low, much, much lower. So of course we are getting a lot of energy benefit by making sure this is non-volatile. So once you make the phase transition, you don't have to keep on holding it. But the more importantly, with the graphene, we can actually make the energy even, even lower. Now, of course the graphene brings some questions to scalability, which I don't have a very good answer, answer for. That is graphene scalable. Um, so far, the jury is still out. There are some interesting um, development, including in TSMC. So maybe graphene can also be done. But the previous device that I said with the silicon heater and GST, that's really scalable. Like that's something actually we are currently working with Intel silicon photonics, where we get the Intel silicon photonics shape and we put the PCM on top of that and we show the phase transition happening. 
Um, but still, the loss is still bigger issues. With this 3 of guy device, we can reduce the loss, but uh, can we do better? So this is the, some of the new work that's going on in the, in the material side. So this is two material, SBS and SBSE, that can give you significant reduction in the power. Uh, in the loss, you can see in the elisometry data, these materials are transparent, and that gives you very low loss. So this is one of the work that we very recently did. It's uh, currently under review. We put this SBS on our ring resonator, and we demonstrate that we can do the switching. Okay, And you can see these are the two ring resonators. We, we have the switching, and the switching doesn't change the quality factor of the cavity. That's showing that the material is indeed very low loss. Uh, we also can do quasi-continuous tuning. We, we demonstrated a multi-level operation. So, so far, so just think about the multi-level operation gives you the bit precision that you need for the neural network. So if you just do one bit, it's just zero and one, right? So it's a one bit precision that could be interesting, but we have shown that we can go up to the five bit precision um, using this kind of uh, PCM, this, this new PCM that we, we demonstrated here. Um, so really kind of maybe kind of sum up that what where we are today that we envision creating this kind of network so each of this network is your one vector matrix multiplication but light will be just going through this whole chip like extremely quickly you have the weight embedded in it and that's how we can get the multiplication done right and we have shown so far that if this one of the switch is possible it can be scalable uh, so we think there is a much significantly higher density of switch programmable unit we can create with light that gives you a very large matrix. Now, I will be talking a little bit about it. Very large is large for optics, but it may not be large for electronics. So this is something that uh, that's where my second topic comes in. That we, we, we made a lot of progress and I'm pretty sure that some of these things can be scaled more and more. But can we get to a point where you get better than electronics is still a question that I personally don't know the answer for, okay? But let's talk about how do you get the nonlinearity. The nonlinearity is generally very hard to do in optics. So we proposed this effect called self-electro-optic effect. And the idea is that if you have a photonic system, you have some light incoming out, light out, you take some of this light, maybe as terms of absorption, and if you feed it back with this optoelectronic feedback, can you do nonlinearity? And turns out you can. So this is some of the things that we did in silicon photonics. Uh, by biasing two ring and two of this kind of optics, we can actually this kind of optical biostability with using the ratio of this device. So this is a symmetric self-electro-optic device. And I'll point out that some of this work were done in Bell Labs using quantum well structures and our main idea is to bringing that in the optical domain, okay? But this really kind of asked me this question, is integrated photonics really the way to go, okay? And there are several benefits for integrated photonics. It's very important for optical communication, it's on-chip, compact footprint, and the alignments are automatically done with lithography, so you don't have to align them. But there are several cons, and I personally believe that there is a lot of reasons why this kind of integrated photonic based solution may not be super exciting to the real practitioners of neural network because you guys are probably looking into problems which has a huge dimension of the matrix. It is showing that there are some promise, but can it be scaled? That's the question that we need to kind of understand, right? Can you do deep neural network, right? I mean, so I'm going to just basically each layer, you are going to lose light. So can we actually regenerate the signal as it propagates? And the answer so far is uh, not very promising. So where I think that maybe as a practitioner in the field, you might be more interested. And that depends on kind of really applications that you, you think about, like what kind of applications. It's really this meta optical information processing. And the idea is that can we do computer vision, computational imaging task using this kind of large scale free space optics. And I'm gonna show you that what is possible uh, with that, that might be like some huge number that we can really do, okay? So the idea is, can we combine a meta optics? Meta optics is like for, for, for time being, let's assume that it's an, it's an optics where you have control over each pixel. I can make, a surface where I can pattern each pixel exactly the way I want, and we can create a freeform surface using a single surface. It's a diffractive optics. It's a sub-wavelength diffractive optics. I do not want to go into more details about that. If you're interested, I can discuss that how, what is the difference between them. But a meta optics is just optics. But can we have a meta optics 
and a computational backend together to do some of the work, right? And we had working on this, on this idea for quite some time. We have demonstrated getting a very high quality imaging. We have demonstrated spectroscopy, very focal imaging, depth sensing using this framework. Now, this framework is actually a fairly interesting way to rethink the deep neural network architecture. Generally, like if I think about like as an optical scientist, I, I envision deep neural network as a layers of linear and nonlinear transition layer. We have a linear that can be convolutional, all optical, and then you have a nonlinear like ReLU or some sort of soft max, and then you do, do your work. Is it possible to bring a lot of elements in before and then you do software? Okay. Now, I want to kind of point, take some time because I feel there is a fundamental misunderstanding in both optics and machine learning community when I discuss this thing. In fact, I have a paper that a proposal that just got rejected where they said that, oh, all those linear layers is essentially a single layer, okay? Um, that's not, that's true, but there is some problem with that. Let me explain that what is the problem. First of all, as you know, that we want to bring very little linear operation and nonlinear in the in, in, when you start in your software or electronics, because electronics are really lousy at doing this linear operation. You start with a huge dimension of data, you want to reduce the dimension as soon as possible using some sort of convolution, and no one really uses a fully connected layer to start with, and some nonlinearity. So if you start thinking about creating an extremely large linear layer, how do you train it? It's not, so, it's not simple. So the way to train this, you kind of break it down into multiple linear layers so that each, like if you think about that you have multiple convolutional layer, it is true that mathematically you can get a single layer, but that single layer will have a lot of zeros. And when you're doing implement in the optics, you're just going to make a huge element you have to train that. It's not sure that how you are going to train. The second thing is, just because you have a single layer matrix doesn't mean you can implement, you may not be implement that using a single layer of matrix. In fact, I'm going to show you that you need at least three layers. By a three layer, you can probably do any arbitrary matrix implementation. So anyway, so there are some, I think, misunderstanding that just because you have a multiple linear operation that doesn't necessarily take, take it away from deep neural network. In fact, what we have shown, I'm not going to discuss much about this, that using a knowledge distillation technique, we essentially train a master network, which has all those fancy bells and whistles, like a lot of nonlinearity. And then we implement a teacher, like, sorry, a teacher network we implement, then we implement um, a student network. And the student network will knock off all those nonlinearities. So we kind of come up with some of like this. So you can just remove this, all those nonlinearity. And using that knowledge distillation based training, we can come up with a student network that has a lot of linear layers and some nonlinear layers. Uh, so we are reducing the number of nonlinearity in this, um, in, in this layer, um, in this deep neural network architecture. So this is actually a fairly, in my opinion, that how to train these networks are not very well known when you have a lot of linear operations in the beginning. And then we do the, everything in optics. Optics is essentially linear operation. And then we do a handoff to the software. And what optics is essentially doing, it's taking this huge dimensional data and it's doing an encoding. You're compressing the data. So this reduced order data now, reduced dimension data goes to the software. And we can argue that if the software gets less amount of data, it requires less power and less latency. So that's the idea that can we use an optical front end and optical encoder, and then we do a digital back end, but only one time handoff. Can we actually use that? Okay. So that also brings the question that do you really have a benefit for using optics, right? So this is kind of our framework to explore that benefit. And the framework is as follows we are going to use everything at incoherent light. So the light that come from image and scene, everything will be incoherent. And the way we are going to do the handoff is through a camera, okay? So if you are, let's say in a system, like in, in, in a car driving, your light is coming from ambient scene. So that light has no power. 
and whether you captured the image, whether you captured like a reduced dimensional image in terms of like passing it to many, many optics or just using lens, your sensor power is sensor power. So essentially, the, there are two approaches. In one of the approach is um, just pure digital, that's a red line, that you have some scene, incoherent light comes in to your camera. And we are calling it just been the pixels because we want to do it that way in the actual experiment. But you can think about that you have just an n pixel camera. And those n pixel goes to an electronic layer, a software or any electronic implementation that you want. Whereas for the our encoder option, we start with an, 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 a digital image, but we send through a, a, this kind of meta optics. Okay. And then you collect also n number of pixels. And we keep the topology of this electronic layer same. So same number of layers, same number of like nonlinearity, same number of neurons. So we can argue that the power taken in this optical front end in same in both cases, ambient light and the sensor power, and the next light, the, um, the, 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 the digital backend, that power, we don't know what that power is, okay? But we can argue that that power and latency is proportional to N the number of data that we are putting in into that layer. Okay, so can we get, um, how do you train these things? So we actually implemented a full end-to-end -end optimization where optics is uh, implemented like the Fourier optics in TensorFlow. And then we, we, we train the optics with the computational backend and we come up with these designs. Each of them are essentially how many data we are passing to the computational backend. And then we compare our performance. And what we find is actually fairly interesting. And at least it was fairly interesting to me and fairly intuitive as well. If you pass a more and more amount of data to your computational backend, the software backend, at some point of time, you don't see any benefit. So there are three lines. The orange line is the this, this, this approach of uh, optical front end and electronic back end. In theory, the blue is, um, electronic backend theory and the, the, the other color, the ash color is, is the experiment. So they match fairly well that when you have a very large number of layers, you don't see any benefit. Well, it's a large number of data that you're putting in. But if you send like very few amount of data so that in that case, you are actually essentially having less power and latency in your computational backend, your electronics fall off much more quickly than the optics. So you find that regime where you have a photonic advantage what are, we, what are we saying that given the same power and latency constraint, if you use an optical front end, that optical front end is designed to capture more information from the scene, you can actually get more power, uh, better performance than just electronics. And these things actually fall off in, at a very low because of the noise. Because if you are, in this case, you are just passing one pixel, so the noise becomes very detrimental. But these are experimentally, we show that there is benefit almost up to 10%. This is the thing that I was mentioning that you can use this kind of the knowledge distillation to now come up with a large matrix. Uh, you can train these small matrices and then you can collapse it to create a large matrix. I'm not going to go more details, but we have shown that it is possible. We are working on that. Um, the second idea with this, like this one, we are basically doing this end-to-end -end training. So how, is it a convolutional layer? We don't know. It's, it's a very weird optical processing that's going on. But can we start thinking about doing the convolution only? So it turns out from optics, we know incoherent imaging is a convolution process. So if you have an object with some intensity distribution O of X and Y, the image that you get is the convolution of O, X and Y with H, X, Y is whole square, where H, X, Y is the coherent point fit function and H, X, Y is essentially you're taking a square of that. So we can make a convolutional kernel. Um, and if you can make k sub p and k sub n, because this is actually, a, this is square, so there's no negative, but we can take the positive part as k sub p kernel, negative part as k sub n, and then we can have a meta optics. We, we, we design, a, forget about meta optics, and an optics to have that PSF. So we are essentially taking this problem as a PSF engineering problem, which is a very well-known, well, -known, well or kind of a holography problem that I want to create an optics which gave me that PSF. Can we do that? And it turns out you can. So these are some of the things that we made. So there are 25 kernels. So for each kernel, I need two uh, elements. One is for positive and one is negative, and then we subtract them. 
um, that's the idea. So we can make 50 optics. You can see how small those are. These are the each of these optics that you can fabricate. If you zoom into it, you will see like a nano pattern here. So this is how we kind of make our structure. And then we show that you can actually do convolution, right? So you can do 50 convolution at least. And technically there is no limit. It's up, we did 50 because we didn't want to spend too much time fabricating the structure, but 50 convolution, you can do all in parallel, with the speed of light. Okay. And these are like different elements that you get in and then you subtract that. And uh, we, so far, experimentally for C410, um, we get a 75% classification accuracy. Whereas in the, if you just remove the optics, just the electronics, we get 65% accuracy. So we are getting a 10% accuracy improvement for the same power and latency. But again, I want to kind of point out here, if you are not limited by power and latency, optics should not give you any benefit. And there's a very simple way to explain that that any optical process you can model digitally. So there is fundamentally, there is no benefit you can get from optics unless you are really constrained by the power and latency. Okay, so can we actually do arbitrary vector matrix multiplication? So it turns out, yes, so you can create a lenslet array and the, each lenslet can create an image, like many, many images of that. And then you can put another meta optics there where the row, like each element will be your weight and with that, we have, this is something that we are working on experiment, but based on our understanding, we can do a vector matrix multiplication of a matrix size of this number, 10 to the power five by 10 to the power three. And to, the time it takes to do this thing is the, for the light to cover, travel the whole optical stack, which is very small, so in one nanosecond. So potentially, we can give you 10 to the power 17 operations per second. It's a binary operation though, like, I mean, you can think about the each vector matrix multiplication is happening. So you can put like some weight in the, how we are changing the, but the number of operations that's happening is a single operation. And you can get 10 to the power 17 operations per second using this kind of uh, vector matrix multiplication in free space. And it's not like the free space is, is well known that you can have very large space bandwidth product, but the, the really, I think the benefit here is we can fabricate them in semiconductor, we can stack them. So it's a good time to kind of start thinking about some of this problem, which were well known from before. There is another important thing to kind of recognize here that our goal is not to do vector matrix multiplication. Our goal is to do a neural network. And why it is important, let me kind of go back to here. This kind of idea, the positive and negative is called dual aperture synthesis. People have thought about it. It did not work very well. The reason it did not work is because when you subtract those two image, your signals get subtracted, but noise doesn't. So noise adds up. And so if, if we're just looking at the convolutional result, there will be some discrepancy. But the computational backend, you can train it to remove those noise. So in general, like the neural network is more noise robust and we have a computational backend. So as I mentioned in the beginning, right, the understanding of adaptive algorithms, understanding of AI more and more, really help us to kind of figure out that how to train this backend, which will be more noise resistant. So you can take advantage of this really large space bandwidth product that comes from optics. Okay, um, so how do you do nonlinear processing? That's the hard part. Um, I'm going to mention like a little bit like that what, why it is even harder. Um, you can get this kind of optical biostability, no issue. You can, people have looked into this, but doing this all in the process in a parallel fashion, you need multiple cavities. And that brings an interesting problem, which I don't have time to go about, but what, how do you make a cavity that preserves the image quality? If you put an image, image and put it in optical resonators, what comes out is the eigen mode of the cavity. And that really took us to kind of a little bit more wild goose chase. And we found that in atomic physics, people have looked into this kind of stuff in AMO physics. And there are some cavity called degenerate cavity that looks like this. And we actually implemented now, we are looking into some of those things in doing it with the meta optics. There's another thing that has got a lot of interest in recent years is called flat band because of this bilayer um, graphene that you have a flat band, you get the superconductivity, but it's a, essentially the flat band is a wave effect. So you can see that in optics and the, what flat band means in optics that you have an optical system with the same resonance frequency for different angle. And any image, when you're bringing an image, like the, the image you can think about in the case space, light coming in different angle, you can use the flat band to do this kind of uh, processing. Finally, very 
briefly. Like I talked about, so so far I've mostly talked about linear operations. How do you kind of scale it up? Um, we talk about even nonlinearity. How do you do like a large SLM? And we are kind of uh, going to keep some time for questions, but essentially, if you look into the simple math of that, to have a reasonable power for the SLM, creating very um, high-speed special light modulator, which of course has a lot of other applications other than being an optical neural network, um, you need to have a very small pixel, okay? But at the same time, you don't want to lose light in the higher order diffractions. If you use an SLM and you shine light, you'll see like many higher order diffractions. And the reason it happens is we come from very simple physics, like we know from the diffraction grading. But if you go back to that physics equation, the physics equation tell you A, that's the pitch, sine theta is equal to lambda. That's where your first order maxima happens. So sine theta is lambda over A. If you make that A, the periodicity smaller than lambda, then sine theta becomes greater than one, which cannot of course happen. That means that you can guide all the light to zero order diffraction. So there are two things that you need. One is, very small pixel and very small pixel periodicity, both supports low power consumption for the SLM. And this is not for low, for to make it low. It's just like if you that much power, your chip is going to burn. It's just not possible to make it like um, the, that kind of high power, high volume, uh, the, the, the thing that you are changing. And then at the same time, you, you want to have small periodicity to get like all the R and zero thought so don't lose any light. But then the signal routing becomes a very important problem. And we had this idea that we can actually decouple that so we can control these things in electrically in a different plane and combine them optically. So these two sub-wavelength requirements for electronics and optics, they don't have to be at the same location. They can be at two different plane altogether. So you make so one of the ideas we have recently shown that you make a 1D SLM, but using an holographic meta-optics, we can arrange in a 2D. So you can create a 2D SLM. You have the same number of pixels, but in 1D, sig routing signals become very, very simple. So there, there again, there, there are some, the routing challenges are kind of a very, fairly interesting problem, which often like physicists maybe look, look over, but as an engineer, that's what we kind of let make this make the system. And uh, so we also have shown that now we can make everything in the PIC and we use meta optics to bring them together. We can create like different. So these are like essentially how the light comes out of the PIC, but putting different meta optics, we can shape them differently. So that's kind of, I'm going to be running out of time. So in summary, I told you about the integrated photonics and meta surface based solution. And I'll kind of maybe, this is, there is a slide that I tell the optical engineers, um, but I'll show it anyway that in general, like if you go to these optics, right, we, we are all trying to make a best optical computer. Um, but the goal is to make something that's better than electronics and software. And that's really not that easy. And maybe we need to find the niche applications for WNN. And that's why I, I, I talk to like people who are pr practitioners in the field to figure out, okay, is there an application? And I say like, I mean, I'm pretty sure that the thing that will ultimately win over will be probably very different than what we all thought that it will be. So I'm going to end here and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, that was fascinating. A lot, lot of stuff there. Um, uh, a little bit of time for questions. Anybody with questions? Chicha. Hi, um, can anybody hear me well? Yep. Yes. Yeah, um, thank you, Arka, for this talk. I mean, it's really amazing to see uh, uh, more detailed content. And as I want to apologize, in the very beginning, I uh, I could not uh, just uh, connect to the meeting successfully, but eventually I, I get through that. And so I wonder what's the, the uh, design pipeline for, for uh, this uh, optical neural network? And do you have... Uh, a particular uh, subject I want to solve. And then you try to design the optical power, electronic power and software uh, separately. And then once you finish this uh, workflow, you what's the flexibility to uh, apply this to a different type of a problem? Good. So, okay, I think there are one aspect of this work that I did not talk at all. Right? How do you design this optics? So designing this optics is a very difficult problem in itself because we have a significant number of 
uh, uh, elements that we need to design. And we are actually looking into some neural network techniques. So how the, the, at the intersection of optics and neural network technique, we can think about that, can I come up with machine learning technique to design those optics? Uh, and that I have not really discussed. We are actually working with few people. I'll be very interested. Like we need very hard optical acceler uh, acceleration. Doesn't have to be optical to design those optical technique. The second question is what we are doing here, right? We we are essentially taking an, an approach that like, an operation that is a bottleneck for you. So it could be a very large vector matrix multiplication. If that is your bottleneck, we can give, we can do that very, very quickly. And then the neural network comes in. Right, so if you have like some problem where you need an extremely large scale vector matrix multiplication, that will be very difficult to do in electronics. I think we can provide you a solution, mostly using meta optics because there we can have this large scale. But integrated photonics can also give you if we can scale it up. But you, it is very likely that after you do this, like after you make this optics, it will be slightly different from what you designed, and you might need to do like a re fine tune the computational backend. So that's where this comes a hardware in the loop approach. So you can put the optics and you can take a lot of data so that you can fine tune the neural backend. But at the end of the day, application is for inference, not for training, uh, mostly that we are thinking about that for inference, you need very, very fast inference. You know what is your problem, like you basically have a neural network that doesn't change, put your meta optics, uh, put your optics there and it can do these things very fast. That's the that's where I think it, it really comes in. Okay. okay more, more questions. If, if not, I, I have a couple. So at, at some point you said, so you were, I guess, looking for the applications for this. And at some point you said that the optical solutions ha have an advantage if you are limited by latency and power. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. That's and correct. that seems like that, that is, that in real life would be often the case. So, um, what is um, why is there a lack of potential <laughs> of potential applications? Why is it a niche? Oh, oh. So, I mean, I think I, I say it niche is because um, it all boils down to that. Okay, for example, right? If you are putting it in in an autonomous driving system, are you allowed? to reduce your classification accuracy to take into account for power and latency, right? So what I'm getting at is if you look into this plot, right? It's not that we are giving the same accuracy. You have a slightly lower accuracy than what is fundamentally possible, mm -hmm. right? This is like, this is the highest accuracy. So you're yes. taking a little bit heat in the accuracy, right? So that's what like, so if the accuracy is not of very utmost importance, right? Or you can think about like, Probably like image, right? I mean, when you search in Google by someone's name, you get a lot of images. Maybe one or two is wrong. That's fine. Right? Maybe for one or two, you have a three or four are wrong. But so that, that's what I'm kind of, I'm saying that, uh, so it turns out that if we can just do vector matrix multiplication, it's not quite clear that what applications you can do is, is what we found. And, and the other thing that is actually very important is how do you train this network? Because when your linear layer becomes really, really large, you cannot really train them very well. So we are, we are developing some of the hardware in the loop approach with the SLM to see if we can train this network using in optical domain as well. Um, so there are a few kind of challenges there. So that's why I think like understanding the applications and providing an application specific solution for your problem is what we are interested. Uh, and like I say, like if you can, if you, do you need to do a very large vector matrix multiplication very, very quickly, then I think we have a good solution. But the moment you need non-linear and all those things, the solutions kind of uh, are not there. That that's that goes back to like basic fundamental physics to understand that how to implement that. I see. So it's it's the nature of the kinds of problems that these can solve in the in the short that's, term. Okay, I see. That's that's correct. Right. Um, yes. And I have one other question. At some point, you were talking about uh, these devices being reconfigurable, but then you were also talking about how you needed to have um, solve alignment challenges um, at the time the devices are fabricated, and so how mm -hmm. how are those um, compatible? So reconfigurable is in the one plane, but you still need other optics, right? So basically you you, you can change the phase mask. Like if you install okay, so five optics, you can change it. But 
they are not like changing all of them in the X, Y lateral position that you need to change and align them. Okay. So the way the plan right now is we can actually create 3D printed mount. So again, like there are a lot of technology improvements. So we can just hard code them, put it in one uh, stack, which was not possible to do before. So in some ways, there is a technological solution to do those things. But at this point, I, I personally think that some of the things that we are doing, we need to demonstrate something that could not be done with electronics. And that part is still the jury is out there. That is there a problem that optics can solve that electronics cannot? And I am like, I mean, if you, I know that the, you guys are looking into some very, very uh, large scale AI problem. If you have a need for creating a very large linear operations that you could not do and you have to, you have to bring in non-linearity very early on to reduce the dimensionality, that's what I think optics can play a very important role. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Do we have any other questions or comments? Yeah. Okay, if if not, then thank you again. That was uh, that was extremely interesting and uh, really really appreciate it. Thank you. And I you have the slides uh, from me. Yep. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out. Okay. And I will touch back with Shichika later also. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.